everybody. Welcome to the It Hurts to Mom podcast. I'm Lauren Rose, and today's topic is mental health, specifically depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Our guest is Sam Ruth, founder of Grief Hab and host of the Be Ruthless Show podcast. Welcome, Samantha. Hi, thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for talking about such an important and under-discussed topic. Yeah, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's start with depression. I think I've had depression since I was about eight. I didn't know that that wasn't normal to be isolating in my room and to stop playing with kids on the playground and just start really being a, a complete introvert, really. I, it just kind of happened, and I didn't know that not everybody did that or felt that way. It just it didn't occur to me. And I, I was in therapy for an eating disorder when I was 15 and 16, I finally went to a doctor and start getting, started getting medications at 22. Um, so when I was officially you know, diagnosed with depression and they really helped. I know if I don't take my medications, I can really tell, like, I, I just can't stop crying and I'm just a complete mess. And how about, how about you? How, how have you dealt with depression? Thank you for being honest about that and for being honest about medication. There are so many stigmas out there, and there are people who are on medication that are afraid to share that, first and foremost. So I think any of us that choose to share that are helping so many people listening, and I guarantee you someone will reach out to you <laughs> because of that. Um, I have what works for me the most is being able to deal with any and everything through nature. I lived in Michigan up until nine plus years ago, and I didn't have that outlet. And being stuck inside and, you know, having weather dictate my activities was a hindrance. And moving really, really gave me more outlets. So to people who live in places that maybe don't have that, I say, really think about things that decrease discomfort. When we're in a bad place, happy, joy, you know, I'm not asking you to get there, but we can decrease the pain and find the things that take it down one notch. So for me, you know, I, I can sit in the dirt and play with sticks like I did when I was a kid and I was finger painting at three in the morning. And, and I think it's finding those things that the rest of the world might say, that's a little bit ridiculous. You're an adult now mm -hmm. that, that help us take the edge off. And then we can think a little bit more clearly about what we need and, and who we can lean on and what are, what tools we need. And of course, for me, I have always leaned on medication as well and leaning on others, which again, isolating is the worst thing we can do for ourselves, And it is a go-to. Yeah, definitely. When I had to stop working due to my chronic pain in 2017, I spent two years in a really deep depression and I, I was almost completely isolated. I didn't like getting out of bed because I was just, I felt like I'd lost my purpose in life and having a purpose in life I had never realized was so important to not only my identity, but my feeling of self-worth and my self-confidence and being able to love myself. And the, the two things that got me out of my deep, deep depression over those two years were one, intentional daily gratitude. So every single night, I held this little um, wooden heart up to my up to my heart, and I just closed my eyes and thought of three things I was thankful for. And sometimes it was difficult and sometimes I didn't want to do it. And a lot of times it got to just be that like, I am thankful for running water or I am thankful for electricity, the things that we just take for granted. And the second thing that really got me through is just believing that, you know, God could take my broken life and make something new and beautiful out of it. And then I started finding joy in, like you said, community, in connecting with other people, going through chronic pain, depression, anxiety, previous trauma or current trauma, and trying to encourage them and help them and give them advice and just make them feel not alone. So I actually started a chronic pain group at my church um, in September, and I started this podcast in September. 
because I wanted to just just bring encouragement and community to people and and make people not feel so alone because I think that's one of the worst things about going through pain or mental illness is just feeling like you're the only one that's going through it and nobody else is. But I don't know the statistics about mental illness, but a lot of people have depression and anxiety. We just don't talk about it because it's there is that stigma. And I think it's gotten a little bit better since COVID hit because we've all been through that trauma together. But it's still kind of a little bit taboo, I think. I think you brought up something really, really important and losing that purpose. And I think I see this with people who have retired. Uh, people who get an injury and can't do something that they love and have done for so long. And you might be at a stage in life where you can't work full time and you can't you can't do a job. And you might think that having a purpose means giving back in that way. And when I lost my husband, I could not function. I, I didn't care about other people's problems. I was figuring out how to get through the day and how to get through life on my own. And I still was struggling with feeling like I mattered as well. And I, I went through feeling like I didn't have a purpose starting over in a new state. And I wanted to contribute in some way, shape or form. So if you are unable to do something big, you can still find something, volunteering with something small for an hour, a week, five minutes at a time. You can find something that lifts you up and also allows you to feel like you are helping in some way, shape, or form. You do not have to find a full-time job to have a sense of giving. And I think that's important that you brought that up because I see it with, with, like I said, with people who have retired and, and, and they might not physically be able to go do this for X number of hours, but you can still do it in a different way. Yeah. And they say one of the best ways to feel better about yourself or to get out of a funk or a depression is to go and do something for somebody else. Right. And it doesn't have to be what you had been doing, right? Like I did not believe I would be seeing clients again, but I love animals. And so I was volunteering and helping with puppies and still doing things to give back. I was helping at shelters on the holidays because holidays are difficult, right? There are still things to do to contribute and not be alone, like you said. Uh, and there are so many people alone. And isolation allows you to just sit with your mind and depression and anxiety, being stuck with your own thoughts and not having other people to say anything to get you out of your own head is a huge, huge issue. So finding things where you're around other people and it doesn't have to be in this day and age, in real life, you can do it virtually. So I, I know it can sound scary or overwhelming, but finding something that fits might be a step out of your comfort zone, not a leap, but one step will be so, so worth it because finding those people who can say, I get it, you're not crazy. They're crazy. <laughs> yeah. And that's how I first started getting out of my depression um, was online before I could get out of bed and actually go enjoy people in real life. I started joining um, Facebook groups. There's a Facebook group for anything. I mean, there's a Facebook group for people who love clouds, you know, and so it, it, whatever you're going through, there's most likely a Facebook group for it. If you have any kind of chronic pain or chronic illness, including, you know, mental illness, there's the Mighty app. So I joined that. And that's the first way I was connecting with people was virtually. So there, there are ways to absolutely you know, connect with other people and do things to help other people without actually getting out of the house. Absolutely. And I was offering support to someone yesterday who was struggling and I mentioned a group and her perception was, I don't want to be around other people dealing with trauma who are moping and complain, but I want to be around positive people. And so 
you don't know what it's like until you try it. The first one might not be the right one. I have someone else who went to one and loved it, but it was while he was on a trip, went back home and couldn't find the same thing. And so we reached out to the one and they offered him a virtual spot. In this world, anything is possible and there is a way. And if you are not able to have that voice, my clients often don't either, either don't have the idea or don't feel comfortable asking the question. And I want to bridge that gap. I want to say, let me call the person who runs that group in Timbuktu and ask if you can be a part of it virtually. Down the road, I want you to be able to do that yourself, but I want you to have your needs met until you learn how to do that along the way. And people are suffering in silence and struggling with depression and anxiety and not having their needs met. And there are people who will help you. And so whatever your perception of getting help looks like, there are people who help you in a way that meets your needs. It might take two or three tries to find that right person, but that person is out there somewhere. Yeah, that's a good point about, you know, different stages or even just a different day. Sometimes I want to be part of a chronic pain group where I can complain about what's going on, but sometimes I want to be uplifted and there are groups for both. There's one called Attitude of Gratitude with Chronic Pain, which is all about gratitude. And then there are other ones that you can just go in and just, you know, do your, your, your complaining and your, your griping about your doctor's appointments and, you know, just you know, whine about your physical symptoms and how difficult life is. And both are important and both provide value to my life in, in different ways and at different times. Absolutely. And when we're in the thick of it, we can't see clearly enough to know what our needs are. Mm -hmm. So just being able to say, I'm going to take a chance I like the name of that one, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, or my friend told me to try this one, whatever it takes to get you to try one. If you like it, stay, if not, don't, it's just being open-minded and willing enough to give it a shot. And if, if you're lucky, the first one's a fit, if not, there's nothing wrong with you. It's a trial and error thing. And you can always add and remove along the way. Absolutely. So let's chat about anxiety now. So this is <laughs> a, a fun topic because this is what I've been dealing with the most over the past several years after I kind of got out of that deep depression. I think I've also had anxiety since I was about eight. And again, I didn't know that things I was feeling weren't normal. I didn't know that not everybody worried about every little thing in life, the small things and the big things. What, is the, what do you think is the hardest part about dealing with anxiety? So that's interesting. So I've had anxiety for probably long, as long as I could remember, four or five, six years old. However, I somehow knew it was different and, and not mm -hmm. everyone thought that way. It just wasn't talked about, you know, and I played sports, you know, you shake it off, you get back out there. Um, what do I think is the most difficult thing about it? I think the most difficult thing about it is that it's minimized. The word itself is used, so is depression by the, you know, but people think that it is the same thing as worrying and you could just put it aside and do the rest. They don't understand that it is debilitating and we don't choose it. And it is physical and emotional. Yeah, I think. I think the hardest part for me, besides an actual panic attack, which is absolutely excruciatingly horrible, um, I think the hardest part for me is that a lot of times my anxiety is completely paralyzing. So I'll be in bed and I will want to get up and go do the dishes. But the thought of me going and doing the dishes is so overwhelming to me. Or I want to go do some other task or some other project. But it's just so overwhelming to me that literally my body can't move. I have missed so many doctor's appointments because my brain was just completely overwhelmed by my anxiety, complete in control. I just, I literally couldn't get out of bed to go to a doctor's appointment. And 
I think that's the hardest part is when it's in complete control of, of not only my mind, but my body too. Great point. And I want to point out that it's different for everyone, right? So we can't just say anxiety looks like this. Right. I have driven somewhere to go to something and my anxiety has been so intense that I don't get out of my car. I have to wait however long it takes to drive home. And I just would rather people, not, I at, now I'll tell them that hasn't happened and I can't tell you how long, but there was a time that I would rather people just think I was a flake and didn't show up because explaining it and finding the words for people who have no clue what it's like, it, there's no way to put it. People don't get it. That's so but, true. There's also people and there, and, and so I have that, but I also have times and clients who have to move, right? I have the client who can't sit in his desk at school and needs to move. And the teacher who doesn't understand that. So it looks like acting out disobedient behavior. So we can't just say anxiety is, and to the world, anxiety is sitting in the corner, shaking, scared. Yeah. For my daughter, she's got anxiety and she's, she just turned 10 and she's definitely had it for the last few years. Hers often comes out as anger and we have to realize in the moment she's having anxiety over doing her homework because X, Y, Z, she doesn't think that she understands it or she's going to feel dumb or whatever the, we think the situation is, but we have to read the situation and understand that she's not throwing her pencil because she's trying to misbehave. She's not, she's throwing her pencil and throwing a fit because her amygdala has taken off and her fight or flight response has kicked in and she is in, in fight mode or if she and takes off to her room. She, right. And, and she doesn't mm -hmm. know how to communicate. That's a great point as well. And that's also, that can go on till even 2025 you don't know how to put it into words. And so it often comes out as anger. Yeah, I know. They say now, you know, an adult is quote unquote 18, but your prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed until your mid 20s, like you're saying. So it's up to us as the grown ups when it comes to our daughter to read the situation and understand, you know, is this a behavioral issue or is this a fight or flight response issue? And we probably get it wrong sometimes, you know, and we don't, we don't always act in the most, you know, sympathetic way. We usually do, but we're humans, so <laughs> we're not perfect at it. But yeah, everybody's anxiety looks completely different. And I know it's, it's kind of strange because I know like Zayn Malik of One Direction has terrible anxiety. He hates to perform and that just seems crazy. Like he's a pop star. How can he hate getting on stage? But anxiety doesn't discriminate, right? Right. Blur Same with Eminem. Oh, really? He, uh, he, uh, he from Michigan, but, like mm -hmm. would get sick, a meet, like right before and then go right out on stage. It's, it's very common, but not spoken about. So I work with clients of all ages, but it's a childlike conversation. Even if you have to say something's wrong and I don't know how to explain it, right? We know how to say I have a sore throat. We mm -hmm. know how to say my back hurts. I think something's wrong with my ankle. We need to be able to say something's wrong inside, like something's wrong. Even if we cannot say more than that, to let others around us know, and this has helped my friends and family a ton at, in, our, in, in, in our interactions, because I don't want to be angry and act out and take it out on others. They don't know, even though I feel like I'm glowing neon when I am having an anxiety attack and I am not okay, they are completely unaware. So unless I say, not okay, something's happening right now, they are unaware. Right, because it's, you know, unless you're having a panic attack and you're hyperventilating and, and crying and such, it's, it's pretty invisible. 
and it's easy to hide. And I just, I think it's much more prevalent than we even know. And I don't know if my family will be listening, but if you are, I love you even growing up. And I'll tell you this, my dad has leukemia. We learned this after he was physically fainting, like collapsing on a trip to California, a group of us, he was tipping over onto me. And so I was crying and reacting. Normal reaction, right? Of course, my father is not okay. He's now on the floor, not okay. But the response that I received my whole life when I was not okay was calm down. It's okay, right? Like depends on who you're around what reaction you will receive. So I was told that something was wrong with me when I was truly needing support. So if that's happening to anyone else, they were wrong. Love you, mom and dad and friends and family. I was having a healthy response to a, a crazy situation and not everyone knows how to respond to that. And, and how to deal with anxiety. So it is okay to say, what do you need? What can we do? Bring in support. But telling someone that they're, they're re responding poorly makes it worse. Um, so get, get some help, get some tools, even just say we're here. Go in the room and call 988 and say, what do I do? Someone's having a panic attack and I don't want to make it worse. Yeah, I grew up in an environment with my family, especially my dad, where we weren't allowed to have, quote unquote, negative feelings. So when I was sad or angry, I, he would literally tell me, you're just a child. You have no reason to be sad or you have no reason to be angry. And so I started stuffing all my emotions in, right? And so one of the things that drives me the most crazy about about people is like my daughter. She She cries a lot. She wears her emotions on her sleeve. And she, she'll come home and say, you know, I was upset at school and my teacher told me to stop crying. And that infuriates me <laughs> because like, I, I, I get they're trying to calm her down and, you know, help her, you know, behave appropriately in the social situation. But like, we try to really encourage her to feel her feelings. If she's crying, I'm like, baby, cry it out. Feel those, those, those tears, feel those feelings. And I agree. I, great parenting. I, if I, as the teacher, I would be asking for more support. And mm -hmm. are there times that I may have been crying over something silly? Is she a hundred percent of the time having anxiety? Probably not. But majority of the time, she's going through it. And regardless, our feelings matter to us, and we need to be supported. And that is how we learn to develop the skills to work through that and, and to have it happen less often, not be as intense and learn how to whatever she needs to do. Maybe she needs to have permission to go out and call you mm -hmm. instead of being around someone who isn't giving the, the response that is helping her through it. Yeah, that that's a great idea. She's She is getting some um, emotional support with the school because we've we've been in talk with counselors and she's got some accommodations but yeah just the you know stop crying that that's not helpful not yeah. at all <laughs> and with my parents too like my family still doesn't know I have depression anxiety I'm 43 years old because with them it would be just it's it's such a stigma with them if you've got any kind of mental health issue you're you're quote unquote crazy and so I, at this point, I think I would be comfortable with my family knowing because it is what it is. And if they're going to judge me, well, that's, that's their problem. That's on them because I know that, you know, I can't help it. It's just part of who I am. I deal with it. I'm in therapy. I take medications. I'm trying to be the best person I can be, you know, despite of these things. But it, there was definitely a stigma growing up that, you know, even in high school when I was in therapy, that. They threw me in there to fit to fix myself. There were, we never talked about what was going on. We never talked about why I had an eating disorder. We never talked about, you know, why I had that need for control or what was going on with my feelings. It was just 
go to therapy, fix yourself, period. Come back to us when you're, when you're all better. <laughs> I love this. I want to talk about this. And to, I have a book called Faces of Mental Illness. Mm. A bunch, it's 20 of us sharing our stories. My dad called to edit, like basically edit mine and correct the, my version oh. of my life, right? Like that. that nice. Not, <laughs> uh, but I spent much of my life working on fixing my anxiety. And, and I think that's why it wasn't working. When I was in so much pain that I just embraced it and didn't care about everyone else's discomfort and said, this is me, take it or leave it. That's when things started to change. So I think the world has it backwards. We don't have to fix anything. My anxiety makes me more sensitive to other people's emotions and more mm -hmm. able to be who I am. And, and the world sees it as a weakness, but it's a strength. Yeah. And I love that, you know, flipping the script on your struggles, quote unquote, or the things that you need to fix. Cause I agree. Like my daughter is very emotional and that's not always a good thing, but flip the script. She's very empathetic. She knows when something's wrong with her friends. She's the most caring child. If I'm, you know, having anxiety or physical pain or anything, she will come hold my hand. She will stroke my arm. She will give me a hug. She will ask if I need anything. And so, you know, flipping that to what's, what's the positive of, of all of this. And I think it makes me more compassionate as well. And my, my physical pain, is, I think, like made me less judgmental of people in their situations. And so it's, it's not all negative. It's just a part of who we are. And you're right. It's not something to be fixed because it's probably not going to go away. It's just part of who we are. And it's, it's, if the world had a different message, you know, if we grew up thinking how beautiful this is just mm -hmm. who someone is, we wouldn't be judging ourselves this way. And so I, I really do think it is the world that has it backwards and anyone who, whether it is having freckles or having, mm -hmm. you know, I'm short. And I always thought that was such a horrible thing. Whatever you think your weakness is, somehow it is and can be your strength if you do just figure out a way to flip that script. And if I had done it 40 years earlier, I would have saved myself so much. And that doesn't mean my dad or anyone else flips that script with me. But my entire life has changed because I view it differently. Does that mean I don't have anxiety? No, but I don't think it control. I Like I just said, I can't tell you the last time I had a situation like that in the car. Where, you know, so I think it happens less. When it happens, I am able to just say to any and everyone, I'm not okay today, dealing with something, it, it, it runs its course differently. What's the biggest thing that you think helps you when you're feeling a huge amount of anxiety? I have learned to embrace it and not feel like I have to continue my to-do list, continue whatever the, like I am going to pause and listen to my body. And that is not how I ever was. Like I'm a, I'm type A, I'm a planner. I, I'm going to finish the schedule and take care of me at the end of the day. So, um, my anxiety is telling me something and I am going to listen to it. And that might be very inconvenient for others, right? Um, we're women, we're caretakers, that that that's very different from who I was. So uh, I I let I let it I let it run its course. Yeah, I think my answer would be sort of similar. Mine is I think self compassion. So kind of like I think that's a huge part of what is driving you too is having compassion for yourself and reminding myself and reminding my brain that's in this fight or flight mode almost constantly that I am safe and just taking care of myself on those really tough days, even if that means just, you know, lying in bed 
and thinking or scrolling through social media or listening to podcasts, whatever it is, just taking care of myself. Cause you're right. Your anxiety is trying to tell you something. So yeah. you should listen to it. Yeah. And for me, like knowing the things that decrease it, you know, it might not go from a hundred to zero, but maybe you can get it down to 97, right? For me, that is always something outside, something with my dogs, something with music, right? Like, so knowing those things instead of trying to figure it out in the crisis. Yeah, that's good. I know that, and I say that nature is a great way to deal with any kind of you know difficulty and like you, you said you use it for your depression and for your anxiety you know being in nature for all sorts of reasons is really helpful for our mental health yeah it is and I will also point out that my friends and family didn't it was not very socially acceptable to them like they they want they wanted me to be a social butterfly I wanted to be out with my dog now I have two uh, it was soothing. It was peaceful. It was calm. I could breathe. Like life is so fast, and it for it it took the pain down a notch, right? So I had had back surgery, and I lost my husband a month later, and that mm -hmm. took my anxiety to a level the highest I had ever had in my life. Not, like feeling obligated to go to think, like all of it combined, and taking off and just exploring Colorado and going to any new place, I was like, ah, right? I still was missing him, but the rest of the world disappeared. And then they would grow, like they would want me to be with people and people stressed me out. So I think it's also important to remember that people think they have the solutions for you. Mm -hmm. and, and my people didn't. They love me and they mean well, but they don't know best. Not for this, not, you know, you best. Right. So definitely listen to yourself, listen to your body and figure out what works for you. Cause everybody is going to be different. Right. There might be someone that nature stresses you, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, some people love going for a drive. Driving for me is anxiety. You know, I was, I've been in a traumatic car accident, so not going to work. But mm -hmm. I have friends who that is their go-to. So absolutely, it's different for all of us. Right. So let's get into PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So I've had what my trauma therapist calls a significant amount of trauma in my life. <laughs> I've been verbally abused by my dad. I was sexually abused by my cousin. I was raped and physically abused by a guy I was dating. Um, so my late teens, early 20s were, were really, really difficult. And I didn't, I, I didn't get therapy or help or medications or anything for any of it. I just thought, okay, once it's over, it's just going to go away. And it, it didn't. It started popping up in ways that I didn't even imagine. You know, after I got married, there were some issues that I didn't realize were, were there until my husband found out about certain things. And he's like, oh, that's why you do that. Now I get it. It's part of your trauma. And I was in trauma therapy and my therapist recommended the book, The Body Keeps the Score, which is all about, you know, how trauma affects your, your brain and how trauma can get stored in your body. And I started reading it and I came back to her and I said, this seems to be written for people with PTSD. She's like, yeah. I said, do you think I have PTSD? And she just looked at me like, how do you not know you have PTSD? <laughs> like, of course you have PTSD. And so that really was kind of an aha moment for me because all these things that haven't gone away, I, I didn't, I didn't attribute it to that. Maybe I didn't want to think I had PTSD because um, that's reserved for people who have been in wars, right? But it it really seems to fit. And I, I, I now that I've looked into it and thought a lot of, more about it and started reading the book, I definitely realized that I, I do, whether I want to or not. So how does PTSD affect your life? Well, I just mentioned the car accident. <laughs> yes, that's a big so one. I, I will tell you, 
Um, I unfortunately had two, but one, I can't remember how old I was. I was in my twenties and I wouldn't, I wouldn't drive. My mom told me we were going to go to lunch and she dropped me off at a rental car place and left me there because mm -hmm. I, I was like that traumatized. It was, it's, it's hard enough, but I had done nothing wrong. Like, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, I don't know how I can ever, this could happen again. And, and, and then like they, people say the stupidest things had this been one inch more, the car would have exploded, you know, just crazy things. And I actually had three things happen within a very short time span. I had that followed by a house fire. And I was waking up at all hours, rearranging the furniture in case that like in case this fell here and I was creating escape plans and, you know, like mentally preparing for any and every natural disaster. Um, and then you can go stretches and be completely oblivious and fine and something happens and out of nowhere it is like you are right back in that moment and again to the rest of the world you look physically fine and and feel I feel like I'm glowing neon with horns and everyone should be saying oh my god are you okay um so I have learned same thing with my anxiety. Like I really have to be kind to myself and recognize that it is not a setback. There's nothing wrong with me. People feel like, what did I do wrong? I've been okay for X number of days, weeks, months, and now I'm having a setback. And it is, it, our brains don't function that way. Uh, so I just have to tell myself and my clients that we just have to be kind and get through it and um, know that it can and will happen again. Right. I know for me, definitely self-compassion because I there's a lot of shame and guilt when it comes to some of the stuff that I've been through. You know, why did I let myself stay in that relationship? Why did I let myself X, Y, Z? But I, I remind myself that I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't ask for it. It, it really was not my fault. And I, when I get in, in those moments where, where I'm back there, I try to get myself out of it as, as quickly as possible, you know, immediately try to distract myself. It doesn't always work. Sometimes I, I, I sit in it for, for a bit because I just can't help it. I can't do anything else. It's like, I'm, I'm again, like my anxiety, I'm, I'm paralyzed in it, but as soon as I can kind of get out of that being paralyzed, I try to, I try to do something else and get out of it, get my mind off of it. I have found that having one or two people who know, they don't have to know everything, but know Sometimes I'm not okay. Can I reach out to you? Having a code word so I don't have to spill my guts. Um, and being able to, they also lean on me uh, in those moments is super helpful because you're going to need someone. You have just as many bad days as I do. And so finding someone you trust that you can say, help, what up, my coat, peanut butter pancakes. Um, and knowing that that person is going to say, I'm here, let's, you know, and for me, I don't want you to say what's wrong. I want you to start telling me funny stories, getting my, distract me, do anything and know that in like, you're going to be, able, you're going to be reaching out to me in return and, and it's reciprocated. If you have one or two people that you can find that with, that is huge. and they will reach out as much as you do. And, and then that weight, that pressure, that um, fear, that what am I going to do goes away. Because even though you're miserable, you know you at least have someone to vent about it to, like to get through it with. 
I love the idea of code words. We have some code words with my daughter when it comes to certain things that she has trouble expressing. If she's feeling like, you know, she's being ignored in a situation, she'll come up to me and just whisper giant lollipop. And I know I need to, you know, make sure to start including her and give, giving her attention. And we've got code words when it comes to her anxiety and my anxiety and certain feelings, you know, we've got cotton candy and we've got marshmallow. <laughs> She made them all up. They're all sweets. <laughs> Listen, I, I have to tell you what, I love how she did that. She did what I would encourage. All positive, fun, uplifting, right? So if you're in public, if other people are around, nobody's going to be like, what's wrong? <laughs> it's easy to say. It's, you know, it, it's not going to make you stop and feel like you're a burden. I love it. Yeah. And they're, they're all, all fun words that make her happy. And, and it, it's just something quick. And if she's having trouble early expressing herself, because even though we created an environment and we try to create an environment where her feelings are encouraged and validated, she still has trouble expressing, you know, her feelings sometimes, and especially in words. I mean, she's only 10 years old. So when we can help her get a word or two words that will give us an idea of the situation, then I think that's really helpful. And for people who want to make it even more simple, just do red, purple. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, it's, it, and it doesn't have to be permanent. It can be until you are able to say, I'm having a really bad day. Can we talk? But it is a great way to go from keeping it all in to letting people know something's on my mind and I don't know how to let you know. That is so good. I love it. And having one or two people that you can have that code word with and they won't have to ask you what's wrong because they'll have a general idea. And you you get, you know, set expectations ahead of time. When I say this, I want you to tell me funny stories or just you know, be there present with me or whatever it is that you think you need in that moment. Cause everybody's different. Everybody's going to need something different. And as your daughter gets older, you might do this. I have some teenagers who, you know, certain color on the door means I'm crabby. I'm doing my homework. Mm -hmm. Please wait until I take the, and you can't do it for day. You know, you can't have mom and dad not come in your room forever, but it's a tool to avoid the arguments. This, like, I know I'm going to snap at you and I don't want to have a fight. So I'm letting you know, bad day. Yeah, that's really good because my daughter's recently told me that, you know, she's just been in a bad mood lately and she doesn't know why and she can't help it. And, you know, I'm wondering if her hormones are starting to kick in and everything. But I think that's a really good idea because that, that way she can communicate without having to snap at me or say things out loud or, you know, start those, you know, back and forth, irritating, short, you know, snippets back and forth. So I think that's a great and idea they too. In return, I'll add, I, you know, someone said, can my, can you ask my parents to do this too? Because there are days I can tell something's up. Like maybe my dad didn't get a good night's sleep, but my dad will just seem grumpy. And I'm wondering what could I have? To, I didn't do anything. It can't be me. Right. So they want that from us in return mm -hmm. as well. Uh, that's an excellent point too. Because, you know, grownups, we can get crabby too. <laughs> sometimes we have trouble communicating things too. And sometimes, you know, I, you know, when I'm dealing with, you know, previous trauma, I don't want to have to explain that to my daughter. I, I, I can't, she's not ready. And so having some kind of system in place where she just knows that something's going on, you know, I'll, I'll be okay, but, you know, we're not going to talk about it kind of thing. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, because she, they're smart. She knows she needs to know you'll be okay. Right. Well, I think this has been a really good conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having these conversations. I love what you're doing. So where can we find out more about you and about your podcast and your business? Everything is at samantharuth.com. Anyone struggling can also look for um, the Grief Hab group. It's on Facebook, but you can also, it's also at samantharuth.com. Uh, make sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any health, parenting, or life advice.
for my freebie, 30 ways to relieve pain without taking a pill, go to it hurts to mom.com slash tips or at it hurts to mom on Instagram. If you have comments, suggestions, or want to be on this podcast, email me at it hurts to mom at gmail.com. I wish everybody a blessed day. Thanks.